the most highly regarded teachers of our tradition, and Parashurama asked some questions. He was initiated by him and he went to Mount Mahindra where he meditated for 12 years. But having still more questions, he returns to ask Tattatreya and in response, Tattatreya begins by telling him various stories. The very first of these stories is that of the princess and the prince. Himalekha, the princess, and Himachuda, the prince. So we start in chapter 4. And in this chapter, this is a dialogue between the prince and princess. The princess is the teacher, and the prince is not initially asking questions in the sense of a seeker. But he is speaking as a lay person, as a person who, is ha who has material interest. And the unusual part of this text is that there are, in the story is told, three very strong female teachers. It's the Tantric text and the female energy or Shakti is of course absolutely the most important aspect of this tradition. So chapter 4, the awareness of Hema Chuda, the prince. Being embraced by the prince and hearing him with an innocent smile, Hema Lekha said, listen to me my love, it is not true that I do not love you. But I am constantly preoccupied, trying to decide what is the best and the most joyful thing in the world, and what is not. I cannot understand what is right and what is wrong. For many days I have been brooding on this. But being a woman, I cannot find a satisfactory answer. Please let me know the solution. So, we know in the last chapter that the prince complained that Himalekha was not really attentive to his loving approaches and during the time they spent together, during their intimacy, she seemed to be somehow otherworldly, preoccupied and distant. Being upset, he asked her what was the matter? What was she so preoccupied about? And she says, I'm trying to think about what is the most joyful thing in the world. What is the difference between right and wrong? But the nicest part is that, that she plays a game. She's playing a little game here saying, I'm being a woman, I do not know the answer. Can you give me a solution? And of course we know that she is a very wise woman, an enlightened woman, and she doesn't disturb his his idea of being the strong person who knows everything, these are the roles of the relationships that are played generally in society. There's a similar relationship very often between teachers and students. And sometimes students who think they know everything because they have read a few books, are brought back to track by teachers, sometimes in a firm manner, but sometimes in a more loving manner. And Himalekha chooses the more loving approach here, knowing well that her husband, the prince, has really not thought about these matters at all. How do you bring these matters to the attention of somebody who has actually not given any thought to this before. Being in the situation that she is married to him, she is, she must somehow reveal herself eventually. 
And for that, he must understand this. And at the, the way he, things were in the beginning of that relationship, he very clearly did not know who she really was. You may recall that he fell in love with her because she looked so beautiful. But there's far more to her than just beauty, just physical beauty. So when Hemalekha tells him, being a woman, I cannot find a satisfactory answer. Please let me know the solution. The prince laughed at her remark and told her, even animals, birds and insects sense what is pleasant and what is not. They're naturally inclined toward what is pleasant and repelled by what is unpleasant. What is there to brood about? The things that give you joy are pleasant. The things that do not are unpleasant. You, my love, are very innocent. Why are you so perplexed about this subject? Himalekha replied, You are very brilliant, so please help me understand. Women are by nature weak in their decisions, but you can decide. Therefore, please counsel me. You can see from these dialogues that in retrospect, perhaps the, the prince might think how foolish he was to fall for that. But she is, she's kind of, you know, playing him along. And you can see from the prince's comment that he has not really contemplated very deeply about these matters. So hey, Malika continues, Once my ignorance is dispelled, I can stop worrying and enjoy life with you. Dearest, you are such a deep thinker. You have explained to me that things from which one attains pleasure and pain are ple pleasant and unpleasant. I am confused, however, because the same object that is a source of pleasure one moment gives pain the next. So how can I decide what is pleasant and unpleasant? For example, in winter a fire is pleasant, but on a hot summer day it is intolerable. A fireplace is always welcome in a cold climate, but in tropical countries it is not needed. The same principle applies to one's wealth, spouse, children, kingdom, and every other pleasing object. For example, your father is graced with a wife, children and wealth. Then why is he worried all the time? While those who do not have wealth like you do not worry. No object is able to give you joy forever and ever. No one's desire is ever fulfilled and no one is happy. Lord, this is not joy at all because it brings suffering. There are two kinds of pain. External and internal. Disturbances of the humors causes pain in the body. Conflict causes pain in the mind, for the mind is filled with desire. Pain of the mind is intense. Because of it, the whole world is in bondage. Desire for enjoyment is the cause of pain. Those who are slaves of desire always suffer. Even the devas in heaven work constantly to fulfill their desires. O oh, Prince, even after enjoying the desired object, craving does not diminish. Actually, real pleasure is impossible to attain. Nature regulates the life of the animal kingdom, but the hearts of human beings remain laden with the desires for sense gratification. If they can be fulfilled, then all will be happy in the world, but that's not true. For suffer, a person suffering from fever can be re relieved by cool water, then a person with desires can also be happy. It is said that the embrace of a woman is enjoyed by men, but if it is a rough embrace, it is painful. After making love, people feel exhausted. O oh Lord, tell me the secret of how to transform this pain into pleasure. Do dogs not experience the same kind of gratification that a man does with his lover? If you argue that the man 
experiences more pleasure than animal because he sees the beauty in women. That is untrue. The perception of beauty is in the beholder's eye and is no more than a dream. Listen, here is a story. Long ago, there was an extremely handsome prince. Before I continue reading, I would like to just stop and make a comment. We see the dialogue now that Hemachuda basically dismissed the entire discussion by saying very simplistically that everybody knows what is desirable, what is not desirable, what is pleasant and what is unpleasant. Things that make us happy, give us pleasure are pleasant and those that do not give us pleasure are unpleasant. But she refuted his argument while all the time saying, oh Lord, you are the wise one and you can explain this to me and you can answer my questions. But in fact, she's leading him to question his own thinking by giving these examples. A fire can be pleasant for one person under certain circumstances, like in winter, but under other circumstances, in summer, for example, it is unpleasant. So each person sees things differently. She talks about humans and animals. So once again, it's not the object alone. It's also the perception or the understanding of the mind which makes a difference. And now comes the story within a story within a story. So now Himalika is narrating a story as well. Long ago, there was an extremely handsome prince. His wife was exquisitely beautiful and could easily capture any man's heart. The prince was very devoted to her, but she was secretly involved with one of the servants. The servant would give the prince a large quantity of liquor and make him drunk. After he was senseless, the servant would send an ugly maid to sleep with him while he himself made love to the beautiful princess. For a long time, the inebriated prince continued sleeping with the maid, believing he was enjoying the company of his beloved wife. He used to consider himself to be the most fortunate man in the world. Then one day, the servant poured the liquor and left. But for some reason, the prince did not drink as much as usual. Excited by desire, he hurried to the royal bedchamber. The bedroom was beautifully decorated. Like Indra, the king of gods, rushing to meet his wife, Sachi, the prince hastened to his room and joined the maid asleep in his bed. The prince made passionate love to the woman he found there. Then, as he calmed down to his astonishment, he discovered that she was not his wife, but an ugly maidservant. He was infuriated. He wanted to know where his wife was. The maid realized that the prince was sober and kept silent, trembling with fear. The agitated prince caught hold of her hair in his left hand, picked up his sword in his right. Angrily, he shouted, Tell me the truth or you won't live another moment. In order to protect herself, the terrified maid revealed this, the truth. Then she brought him to his wife, who had been making love to the servant. The prince saw his wife lying on a mat, spread on the ground in the embrace of the servant. The servant was tall, ugly and dirty, and was exhausted from lovemaking. The prince's arms were wrapped around his body. The princess's arms were wrapped around his body like a creeper. The servant was embracing her. They looked like a thorny vine intertwined with flowers. The prince saw his wife in deep sleep and for a moment was overcome by love and desire. He thought, I should be ashamed of myself for getting drunk. Shame on those who indulge in sexual activity and lose their senses. 
Men say women change their love and fly away. But in reality, men are polygamous. What can I say to myself? I was stupid. I loved her dearer than my heart. I'm ashamed of myself. As the beautiful birds do not sit on the same tree every day, so the beautiful women do not belong to one man. But who am I? I am like the calf of a buffalo, completely engrossed in attachment, and so far I have loved to live this way. As a courtesan does not love one person, so is the nature of women. One who trusts them is like a wild donkey. It is amazing. Until now, I did not understand the nature of women. I loved my wife dearly, but still she abandoned me. She was having an affair with another man, but hid it, like an actress who expresses her undying love to an actor in a play. She pretended to love me. I was under the influence of liquor, and did not even know with which women woman I slept. I always thought my wife was my faithful companion. Under the influence of liquor, I slept with that ugly woman. Who on earth could be more stupid than I, who was duped for such a long time? What beauty did my wife see in that treacherous servant, whose features I find so ugly, that she would actually agree to make love to him? She preferred him, even though my good looks attract the eyes of all, and I was fully devoted to her. During the course of this inner monologue, the prince became disgusted with the world and, breaking off all attachments, left to live out his days in the forest. We see from this very um, radical story the nature of the mind that, as the prince expresses in this monologue, that due to the wine, he, he was so deluded. He didn't know what he was doing. He didn't know whom, to whom he was making love. And <clears throat> this, in fact, is the state we are in. We are deluded. We are like intoxicated most of the time. And we mistaken things that we are attracted to as wonderful when in fact they are not. They are a source of pain and not a source of joy. Any questions so far? Or any thoughts or comments? find that these stories, some of them are very strong. The, the images that are painted and they don't kind of, you know, fight shy of, of talking about subjects that were generally taboo in, in society. So they are very, very honest and open and straightforward. And um, perhaps to some people, quite shocking. So you can understand for the time that these scriptures were written must have been very shocking. And that is also why these scriptures were kept absolutely secret. And as the title itself says, Rahasya, secret or mystery. And... Um, there are a couple of more stories that are quite um, strong. And these stories do have the power of shaking us up a little bit. <clears throat> so, Hema Lekha now continues to talk to the prince, having narrated the story. Hema Lekha continued, O oh, prince, Thus you can see that so-called beauty is merely skin deep. Therefore it is in the eye of the beholder. Just as you experience pleasure by seeing my beauty, people find pleasure even in an unattractive woman. 
Sweetheart, I'm going to explain. Listen carefully. The mind assumes an image of the beloved according to the concept therein and a time comes when the image and the object become one. When the mind is restless, the senses are also distorted and when the mind is fully one-pointed, it is neither excited nor distorted but in a state of equilibrium. The image within it is imagination, the infatuation repeats the mental image, but yogis or children remain unaffected because their minds are free of imagery. One finds enjoyment according to one's own concept of beauty. All husbands love their wives, no matter how ugly they are considered to be, and they have children. Superficial human beings whose minds always think of sexual activity find pleasure anywhere without discrimination. A lustful and distracted man projects beauty onto an unattractive body. If a person can see beauty in the human body, which is gross and a gross object, then anything can be considered beautiful. O Prince, beauty is an idea which comes out of the womb of desire. Beauty lies in the beholder's mind and spontaneously flows to the object of love. But the tender minds of children do not recognize it, for they are free from lust. The color and figures of people differ in different races, countries and times. Concept of beauty differs according to race and culture. The faces and limbs which seem distorted to one person are considered attractive to another. People have many different complexions. Definition of beauty differs accordingly. O oh, Prince, everyone, though having external differences, seems to ex enjoy the same pleasures. Even the best of men find pleasure in a woman's company because she is considered to be delightful. Equally, a man's beauty attracts a woman and is enjoyable to her. O oh, Prince, learn to understand this. When one analyzes the components of the body, it has all sorts of decaying elements and it is hopelessly disgusting. A seeker should know this. Those who find delight in the pleasures of the body are like animals. O Prince, this body is full of unpleasant elements. The one who thinks of every part of the body gets disgusted. Same is true of food, even though it has different flavors. Even the most delicious food becomes waste material. After reflecting realistically on the nature of the human body, please tell me, what is pleasurable and what is not? Hema Chuda was surprised at his wife's views. The truth of her remarks changed his attitude towards the world. So in this dialogue, Hema Lekha, speaks of beauty and the human body and I think that it was quite clear that everybody has a different concept of beauty and it really is a concept which we have created ourselves and of course our surroundings have promoted this. A few centuries back the ideal of beauty was different from what it is now. At that time when people faced a lot of famines, droughts, there was not enough food, the ideal of beauty was plumpness. If you were plump, you were considered beautiful. Today, <clears throat> when there's abundance of food, the ideal of beauty is different. Slim people are considered to be beautiful. Similarly, <clears throat> here in the West, the concept of beauty is changing and those who have a tan, slightly brown, are considered to be beautiful. Earlier, it was considered to be beautiful, considered to be beauty, beautiful when you were very light skinned, because it showed that you did not have to work outdoors, and 
It showed you were wealthy. Those who worked outdoors who got tanned in the sun and they were not, obviously not very wealthy. And so beauty was almost like a social class which defined it. And that was the wealthy class of people who did not have to work outdoors. Today it's different. Today the wealthy go out and get tanned. And that is considered to be fashionable. And um, on the other hand, in countries like India, where people are darker, beauty is, has a different concept. Those who have lighter skins are considered to be beautiful. So it's really very determined by culture, by, by concepts that are different at different times in the world, in different cultures, and depending on circumstances. And with so much change, there's no fixed idea of beauty. And then she describes the human body, which some people find attractive, but if you really analyze it, you will find that there's nothing attractive about it. Emma Tudor was surprised at his wife's views. The truth of her remarks changed his attitude towards the world. Pondering her words, he lost interest in objects of enjoyment and developed non-attachment. In the course of time, he asked many questions and came to understand the highest truth. Gradually, he realized that one's own Atman, blissful Tripura, resides in everyone's heart. With this realization, he gained freedom and was able to see the entire universe in his own self. Through his knowledge, both his father and younger brother also attained liberation. The queen, Emachuda's mother, attained knowledge from her daughter-in-law and then gradually the knowledge spread to the ministers and finally to the common citizens. No one in that city remained ignorant. They all attained freedom from worldly craving. That city seemed a veritable city of Brahma, Brahmapuri. The capital became the best in the world. Even the parrots and the sarika birds, while sitting in their cages, spoke in the following manner. Pure consciousness, devoid of objects, is one's own real self, the Atman. Contemplate on that. External objects are not different from consciousness. Consciousness alone is the object of its own awareness. I am that consciousness. It alone is the entire universe. All this is experienced through consciousness by the illumination of the self. O people, cast off your confusion by focusing your minds only on consciousness. Worship and meditate on her. Consciousness is the illuminator as well as the source and support of all. Hearing such sermons coming from parrots, the great sages renamed the city. They announced, because here even the birds discuss the supreme knowledge, henceforth this town will be called Vidyanagar, the city of wisdom. The city is still known by that name even today, thus Parshurama, the company of the wise is the most effective way of attaining the highest good. Thanks to the presence of Himalekha, all the citizens gained wisdom. So you see, Parshurama, the company of the wise is the main source of liberation. So through this story, Natatraya is able to illustrate how the presence of a wise person radiates throughout and influences everyone. The word Guru for example, the word guru actually means gravity. So you take a very heavy object like a planet. Planet Jupiter is the heaviest planet in the solar system. And it is also called guru in Sanskrit. 
the planet is called Guru. It indicates that this planet which has this strong gravitational field attracts, it pulls everything, it influences everything around it. And that is the presence of a teacher, a great teacher, a guru, does the same. The greater his wisdom or her wisdom, the greater is the gravitational field. And anybody who falls into this gravitational field is attracted, is pulled and drawn into it. So, the company of the wise is the main source of liberation. To listen to these teachings, to keep the right company, is one of the best ways of progressing. Any questions or comments about chapter 4? We continue with the story of Hemaleka and Hemachuda. She narrates some more tales and some very amazing allegories, wonderful stories, full of great deal of imagery. And the chapter is called The Helplessness of Hemachuda and the wondrous sermon given by Himalaya. <clears throat> After hearing this praise of Satsang, the company of the wise, Purushurama humbly inquired, Lord, you mentioned that the company of the wise is the root cause of success in spiritual life. This is true. I have had direct confirmation of this in my own life through the company of the sage Samvartha which resulted in my spiritual quest. A person is known according to the company he keeps. People attain greatness merely by associating with Himalaya. Indeed, she was a great woman. I want to hear in detail how she led the prince to the highest truth. Then listen to this divine story that Tatraya began. After listening to his wife, the prince lost interest in external objects and became non-attached to the world. Habits make deep grooves in the mind and it becomes difficult for one to enjoy a life of spiritual freedom. Because of his male ego, the prince kept his emotions hidden from his beloved he passed the time in a mental dilemma. Even when his habits led him to his old ways, he was still aware of his wife's words and was ashamed of himself. Old habits forced him to go back to his previous samskaras and again he repented. His mind went into the old grooves formed by his habit patterns and he brooded on the sayings of his wife. This is an important section here about habits. We're not talking just about day-to-day -day habits like brushing the teeth, but we're talking about mental habits, behavioral habits, thinking habits. And these are very powerful. Some of you have observed yourself, you know that even though you want to change certain habits, perhaps you have you experience very often jealousy or anger. You, you don't like these habits and you want to change that, but you are helpless. These habits keep coming up in spite of your good intentions. And so also, the prince experienced that and he felt also 
bad about it. He repented. But eventually, what happens? The time came when he lost interest in the best food, clothes, jewels and beautiful women. No charm of the world could interest him. He lost his mental equilibrium, as if his entire fortune had been stolen. But because the subtle yearning of pleasure lingered in his mind, he could not renounce all objects entirely. Yet, after seeing the imperfection of worldly things, he did not care to enjoy them. He became gloomy. Himalekha noticed and asked him privately, Why do you not look as happy as you did before? You look sad all the time. Why are you in such a pathetic condition? Do you have a physical illness? According to the wise, the body is subject to disease. It is made by air, bile and phlegm. An imbalance in any of these three constituents can lead to disorders. Disease produced by imbalance affects the whole body. Restoring the natural balance is difficult. Irregularities pertaining to food, speech, sense activities, time, place and physical activity disturb equilibrium. Though the cause of these disturbances ordinarily is difficult to know, there are many ways of treating such disease. If such imbalances of the humors did not exist, no one would have described the various ways of curing numerous disease. Therefore, please tell me, what is the cause of your agony? The prince replied, Darling, I will tell you the cause of my anguish. After I listened to your discourse, the things that appeared, previously appeared pleasant, no longer seemed so. I do not find anything in the world that gives me joy. Though the king has furnished me with the objects of luxury, they do not cheer me any more than pleasurable objects can console a man about to be hanged. Yet I crave worldly objects because I am still a slave of the subtle tendencies of my mind. Darling, what can I do to be happy? You see the dilemma of the prince. He has heard her wise words. He has understood something at an intellectual level. But he is still a slave of his mental habits. So while he sees that this is not useful, this is not healthy, this is not really enlightenment, he is still very stuck here as a slave. And that has aggravated his suffering. It is such agony because he now sees, but is still not reached further in his development to be able to really transform himself. The male ego was mentioned. It's not only the male ego, even women have egos. So the ego does not really want to admit sometimes that it needs help. But finally, when she asked him, he had to speak up and tell her the truth. What is Hema Lekha's response? Seeing her husband's anguish, Hema Lekha realized that because of a previous discussion with him, the prince was beginning to develop this passion. He had the potential for spiritual growth. Otherwise, the dispassion would not have unfolded in him. For a philosophical discourse, cannot make the least impression on those who do not desire liberation. Only after prolonged devotion, when the goddess Tripura bestows her grace, can a person attain the highest state. An important point has been mentioned here, which I would like to emphasize, that if there is no foundation, any discussion of spiritual matters will fall on deaf ears. For those of us who try, like to sometimes convert our family members or close friends, trying to impress upon them the, the importance of spiritual values and um, 
self-transformation, you must remember that you cannot really help anybody who does not want to be helped. So the seed must be there. If the seed is not there, it will not germinate. Try as much as you want. You're wasting your time. When the time is ready, the person will seek this out himself or herself. So she realized that this little discourse of hers made a deep impact, deep impression, and something in him stirred, started changing, something germinated in there. The wise Hemalekha reveals the wisdom of Tripura to her beloved husband. With measured words, she imparted the secret wisdom to the prince. Then that great lady, learned lady, without exposing her learning, started telling her husband the story. So she narrates another story now. As follows. Oh prince, this has happened to me. My mother gave me a maid servant, whose nature was fairly good. Later on, she associated herself with a bad woman. This bad woman was both creative and crafty, and I associated with her without my mother's knowledge. The maid servant was very dear to me. Overpowered by the influence of her crafty companion, I started misbehaving. Because I thought of my maidservant constantly, I became like her. That wily witch tempted my maidservant with beautiful but worthless objects. In secret, she turned my maidservant over to her son, Moha, who was always drunk and had bloodshot eyes. Moha became her lover. He would often forcefully enjoy her, even in front of me. She was possessed by him, and she never abandoned me. Therefore, I became involved with him too. They eventually had a son, Asthira, meaning unsteady, who was stupid like his father. This son was born in a human body. He was very unstable and inherited all the evil qualities from his ancestors. He spontaneously developed a talent for drawing all kinds of pictures. Although he was already clever, his father and grandmother educated him further and helped him to develop his skills. His activities were very creative. My maidservant, though essentially pure, was influenced by the company of that wicked woman. She became attached to her lover and son and began living with them. I could not break our friendship because I too was attached to her. I could not develop self-reliance. Therefore, I became dependent on her. Her lover tried to play with my emotions, but I did not heed his crafty suggestions. Pure by nature, nobody could persuade me. Rumors spread far and wide about me. The people of the world started thinking that I was involved with that wretched man. My maidservant left that unsteady son with me and remained in her lover's embrace forever. I started to bring up that unsteady youth. Then, inspired by his grandmother, he established a relationship with an adult woman. His fiancé, Chapala, meaning ever-moving, ever-changing, could metamorphosize, metamorphosize at any moment, taking the most amazing and surprising forms at will. Through her great craftiness, she controlled her lover. That unsteady one was able to travel innumerable miles in a moment. He would never tire, yet he was always restless. Whenever and wherever he wanted to visit his fiancée, he appeared there instantly. She entertained him by assuming any form he fancied. Living with that unsteady youth, she had five sons, all devoted to their parents. 
and all having distinct characteristics. My friend gave them into my care. For my friend's sake, I helped them become even stronger and more powerful. These five sons built huge, beautiful homes and aided by their mother, they dominated their own father. They called their father whenever they wanted. Once the father visited his eldest son's residence, where he heard the sweetest of melodies, enchanting instruments, and other pleasant sounds. Sometimes he listened to the chanting of the Vedas and Tantric texts, and sometimes to the tinkling of jewellery or the sweet song of the cuckoo. He was delighted living under his son's control and being constantly exposed to pleasing and harmonious sounds. But later the same son turned against his father. The father was distressed to hear the roar of menacing animals such as tigers, the thundering blasts of storm clouds, and the lamentations of many people. Another time, his second son took him to his home where he was offered a comfortable seat, bed and clothing. There he found with the qualities of hardness and softness and heat and cold. Pleasing objects were joys for him, but unpleasant sensations made him sad. He visited the residence of his third son, where he saw objects of many colors. They had multiple shapes. Some were nice and some were dreadful. Among them, some were disgusting, some bright, some exciting, some full of darkness. While he was observing these various objects, the fourth son invited him to his house. At this son's home, he found different kinds of fruit and delicacies. There he ate many delicious things. Some of these were as sweet as nectar, some sour, salty, bitter, as stringent or pungent. While he was enjoying these various days, his last son brought him to his house and presented him with many kinds of flowers. There he experienced the fragrance of many plants. Some were fragrant, some stank. Some had mild aromas while others were too strong. Some smells were pleasant to the senses, others were refreshing, and a few were overpowering. This way he experienced numerous objects. When he experienced something pleasing, he wanted to retain it, but exposure to unpleasant things frustrated him. Thus he continued visiting his sons. Sons were very much devoted to their father. Without him, they would not go near enjoyable objects. But sometimes when the unsteady father was enjoying himself in his son's homes, he would steal some objects and take them home. There he would share them with his fine ch wife Chapala. After some time, one of his wife's sisters, Mahasena, unsatiable one, seduced him and he married her also. Now that unsteady man became attached to his second wife and was forced to supply many kinds of objects in order to make her happy. She would instantly consume whatever he would bring and demand even more. Enticed by his wife, he was constantly busy. His five sons brought objects, but she would devour them and be hungry again in a moment. She made her husband and her sons supply her with many objects of enjoyment. Soon she had two sons of her own. One of them was Javalamukha, Fury Mouth, and the other was Nindi, Nindivritta, Immoral Character. She loved them very much. Often the unsteady father suffered and fainted while embracing his Fury Mouthed son. He was frequently slandered because of the conduct of his corrupt son. He became miserable. Out of attachment, my maidservant sympathized with her unsteady son and keenly felt his pain. Gradually, she became attached to her two grandchildren also. She almost died because of them. I was always with her. 
Therefore, darling, I also was lost and was plunged in untold misery. I remained miserable for many years, suffering because of the misery of my maidservant. But then her unsteady son was fully enslaved by his second wife. One day he departed for a city that had ten gates. He lived there with his mother, his second wife and their sons. He wanted to be calm, but day and night he was in misery. Attached to his two younger sons, he had to face terrible suffering and condemnation. He got tired of visiting his other five sons. He never experienced a moment of tranquility. Suffering from her son's deeds, my maidservant nearly collapsed. Yet in this condition, she lived with her husband, daughter-in-law and grandchildren in that city. Her foolish father-in-law, her husband's grandmother, his in-laws and the husband's other wife nourished her. While she lived in that city, she was completely dominated by her husband. Because of my love for my friend, I also lived there, doing everything for her. Although I almost died because of my friend's suffering, I protected a whole family. Sweetheart, without me, they could not have survived. I protected them all. However, under the influence of ignorance, I lost my equilibrium, became unsteady and fickle, and desiring enjoyments, identified myself with the objects of enjoyment. When I kept the company of Moha, I became stupid. Due to the company of my maidservant, I had to play many roles. Had I left her, she would have died. Because I was in bad company, the stupid men thought I was a corrupt woman. But good men thought otherwise. My mother was holy. She was free from negativity, both mentally and physically. She was more pervasive than space and more subtle than atom. She had profound knowledge. Even so, due to the absence of egoism, she pretended that she knew nothing. While doing everything, she acted like one who did nothing. She was the source of all and at that time self-existent. She was fully detached, though she was the very basis of all. Although she was formless, she could assume all forms. In the midst of everything, she remained untouched. She was present here, there and everywhere, but was unnoticeable. She was full of bliss, yet was not noticeable. And she had no parents. Of course she had innumerable children. Like waves of the ocean, I have innumerable sisters. Oh prince, we behaved alike. I was endowed with the highest power of mantra. That is why I live and sympathize with my maidservant and sisters. Yet I'm pure like my mother. In that city, whenever the unsteady son of my friend got tired, he would rest beside his mother. Whenever he slept, all his children also slept. No one remained awake. During that period, only Prachar, a friend of the unsteady one, would travel back and forth through the two eastern gates to protect the city. My friend would sleep beside her unsteady son. At that time, my friend's mother-in-law and the immoral seductress would cover and protect them. Whenever they slept, I would slip away to my mother, embracing her. I would be filled with joy. The moment they awoke, I instantly returned and was caught up with them again. Asthira, a steady son, had a close friend named Prachara, who looked after the whole city. He was only one, but had many forms and was popular in the city. He protected everyone and always helped them contact the objects of joy. Without him, they would fall apart like the beads on a necklace after the thread snaps. Working with me, Prachara kept that city alive. He inspired and maintained the whole city. When the city became ancient and began to crumble, he led them all to another city. And that way, under the protection of Prachara, the unsteady one became the inhabitant of different kinds of cities. Although the unsteady son was born of a holy mother, was supported by the powerful Prachara, and nourished by me, he was miserable all the time. 
He never abandoned his two wives and seven children, though they tormented him. He continued suffering and never found peace. Sons kept dragging him in different directions. Under the influence of his two wives, he had no occasion to rest. Affected by his fury-mouthed son, he would faint from fever, and no remedy would, could cure him. At other times, in the company of his corrupt son, he was a subject of vicious slander and nearly died of shame. Because of his disreputable nature, he, con he restlessly moved from one city to another. Each city had different character. Sometimes he was forced to live in open, surrounded by wild creatures. Sometimes he lived in cold, dirty or dark places. In this way, living in bad company, my maidservant suffered due to her attachment to her son. Sweetheart, though I was pure, because of the association with her family, I was influenced and became sad. Who in the world can be happy while living in bad company? This is just like a person who is trying to quench his thirst with water from a mirage. In this way time passed and my friend in deep sorrow spoke to me privately. Though she, through me she found a good husband, thus she was able to purify herself and control the negative thoughts and emotions. In my company she became aware of the Mother Divine and overwhelmed by her presence attained freedom. After that she was in bliss all the time. This became an inseparable part of her life. O oh, Prince, only by attaining inner wisdom can eternal happiness and the Divine Mother's grace be obtained. Now I have imparted the way of attaining bliss. This is my direct experience. So that's a fascinating story. I don't know how much you understood of it. So what do you think of it? This story is an allegory <clears throat> and what it means we will find out in the next chapter which is going to be next week. So I hope you will join me next week so we understand the deeper meaning behind the story. Okay. Thank you everybody. Have a nice weekend and see you next time. Bye bye. Bye bye Manisha, bye bye Nita, bye Perry.